Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, I'm joined by two guests. Mr. Bob Luddy, CEO of Captive Air, the nation's leading manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems. Uh, this company also now provides a complete solution of fans, heaters, ductwork, and HVAC equipment. He's also the founder and chairman of the board for Thales Academy, Franklin Academy, and St. Thomas More Academy. I'm also joined by Ms. Emily Lawner, Head of Human Resources for Captive Air and the Luddy Schools. Bob, Emily, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Delightful to Thanks be here. Thanks for having us. Well, I've really been looking forward to this conversation, uh, in part because I think both of you bring together such uh, kind of what to some people might sound like different worlds. You've got the business world, you've got the educational world, but uh, both of you have, a, it seems to me, one foot squarely in both worlds, and you seem to make them work really, really well. So uh, I'm part of what I'm kind of hoping we can talk about today is what leads to success. I think there's, I know Bob, you've spoken several times over the years about your conviction that character really does matter, and that actually being an excellent person has something to do with being excellent in business. So I'm hoping we can kind of get to some of that today. So uh, Bob, I'd love it if you could kick us off with this question: What does it take to be successful in business? Well, it, it takes a wide range of skills, and as one person stated. You don't have to be the best at anything, but you need that wide range of schools, uh, skills because if you're the overall manager, you have to know what you're managing. It also takes what I, we call alertness, paying attention, making observations. And alertness essentially is a precursor to thinking. So if you're not making observations, you're not engaged in conversation, you don't really have anything to think about. Uh, you need this continuous learning curve, which many people fall short of. Every day you have to be learning, you have to be stimulated by other people. And you need uh, resilience because there are many disappointments. So in business, one day you're on top, you feel like you're the greatest, and the next day you, you're a bum, <laughs> everything's going wrong, and you have to be able to, to move through that very quickly. Um, you need excellent people skills, which sometimes we refer to as emotional intelligence. And last, I think most important, you need perseverance and determination to accomplish what you decided to do when you went in business. Because there will be more disappointments, particularly in the early years, than there will be wins. And people tend to, after they get hit hard enough, uh, maybe give up. Uh, Mike, Mike Tyson's famous quote was, everybody has a game plan until they get punched in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> so. If you're going to be in business, you better have a lot of resilience, a lot of determination. I'm going to get this accomplished. And in the end, that's what's going to carry you through. Take us back to one of those moments for you, if you would, where, where you were, it seemed like everything had gone wrong. It, like, just there was no way out. But uh, I mean, obviously, you've been in the business world for, for many years. And you, you've had those downs, but you're, you've had lots of ups. So how did you make it through one of those, those downturns? Well, two quick ones. The first check I received bounced. <laughs> so I was, I was off to an auspicious start. And then uh, in 1980, I came to a period of time at the end of the month where we couldn't make payroll. Thankfully, within two or three days, I was able to resolve it. Um, but I didn't have the sense that we were going to go out of business. I had the sense that this is a big problem. I need to resolve it. So they, even though there was a, there's those temporary problems, you're, you're, you were able to kind of press press on, and, and things took a took a turn for the better. Yeah, you have to look for the long term, and you have to have it in your mind. Uh, and here's what my mother told me: every problem has a solution. It's your job to find the solution. <laughs> it's very clear. So I can't disappoint my mother. <laughs> there we go. Now it sounds like what I'm also hearing in that is a, a sense of, of really ownership and responsibility. If it's if it's your company, that that doesn't mean it's uh, you've got to consult other people or necessarily or or uh, push the problem on to other people. If it's your company, it's your job to solve the problem. Is that is absolutely? That right? uh, there's a saying that the event plus the response equals the outcome. It's up to the entrepreneur to take total responsibility for everything that happens. And if you delegate and it fails back. It's your responsibility. You're a bad delegator. And in order to be an effective entrepreneur, you need to be a good delegator. And sometimes you're going to fail. But you can't blame that person. Blame yourself for making a poor choice. And if you do that, you can improve over time. 
Excellent. Well, um, Bob, let me ask you about kind of a, a, a somewhat recent turn in the, in the business world. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, I mean, we're recording at the end of June. This last month has been Pride Month, and it seems like every business in America has felt the need to let us know that they have opinions about major political concerns. And uh, I, I, I've, I've just gotten to the point where I kind of overlook flags and little statements underneath. If I, if I go to Google, I, I don't really go to Google to find out Google's political opinions. I, I need to find some information. But it seems that every company has this need to inform me of their, their political opinions about something. Uh, do you think this is a wise move for business and industry leaders, or is this some, some other kind of move? What are, what are your thoughts? I follow the lead of uh, Bastiat, who said we need to think long term. And politics is always short term, the arguments are always intense, and, and nobody ever really wins the argument. So politics and business, absolutely no. I will say philosophy, yes. For example, we can talk about human dignity, that we teach, we treat each other with dignity 100% of the time. Uh, we can talk about service to each other and service to our users. These are imperative things that we have to do. We can talk about conservative fiscal management but no politics. So really there's a, there's a big difference then in one, uh, for a company, you would say, it sounds like, that between focusing on kind of core values and applying those core values versus taking a stand on a temporary issue. It can, it can only cause harm. Because generally in politics, half will be with you, the other half will be against you. That's the losing hand. We, we want to be in the 90-10 range when we make decisions. We had a, a company that we use for you know, some of our internal processes send out very explicit political statements uh, before the election. And we started looking at another software where we were like, we don't want to use this anymore. It, it definitely alienates people on, on, I think, on both sides of the issue. Even on the much smaller level of uh, college advising for a specific class, I had a meeting this year with one student who uh, explain that uh, there, there's one portal we tend to use called Common App that helps. It, it's massively efficient. It's the industry leader right now for making college applications the most efficient possible. But they sent out a statement affirming Black Lives Matter and explaining their stance on George Floyd and all kinds of other issues. Well, this student wanted to let me know that uh, she was not going to use that program for her college applications because she was just so bothered and offended by that statement. Not that she had opposite views, but she really just said, like, that's irrelevant. I'm looking for the best way to get into college. I'm not looking for your views on that. And of course, we had a whole other discussion about, like, well, at one point, you have to ask the question, do I, am I convicted enough about this that I'm willing to take that stance of looking for alternatives? Do you care enough about this to go way out of your way <laughs> to personally contact every college that Common App will contact on your behalf and all that? But I thought it was really interesting that um, companies seem to be, it seems to me that companies are losing part of their market share even while they're taking these stances. Yeah, you think about it, when you buy a product, you don't know if it was made by a conservative, a wild-eyed liberal, a Marxist, you just know they made a product and you bought the product. If someone serves you, you don't ask them, are you a Democrat or Republican? <laughs> you just ask for good service. Yeah. So I think that almost affirms the point that we're trying to make. The politics has no place in business. And I think Bob does a good job, you know, when we have new hires come in, both at Daily's Academy and with Captive Air, um, kind of orienting them to the company culture, which leaves out all that political stuff. But we do talk about how Captive Air was founded and why we do what we do. It helps them to understand the decisions of the company. He, he'll send out emails with things that he's written about, you know, current state of the economy, inflation, things like that. And it just helps inform our employees on how Captive Air runs, why we make the decisions that we make. And, and I think it helps them to, to really understand where we're coming from. And concerns that we have, for example, um, most of the semiconductors come from Taiwan. They have the leading edge technology. If China were to overtake Taiwan, it would be a big problem for the U.S. So this is things that we need to be aware of and we need to prepare. So it's germane to business. You can say that everything has some political context, but we try to stick with very factual information that's germane to business that allows us to service our customers better. That makes a lot of sense. So. Um uh, Emily, since you mentioned uh, Bob's writing, I want to jump to, to that question for a moment. Um, uh, Bob, back in uh, 2018, uh, you wrote your autobiography, Entrepreneurial, From Startup to Market Success. 
Uh, and o I know over the years you regularly contribute to various uh, magazines, particularly I'm thinking of the American Spectator. Uh, what inspires you to write? Why, why do you take time that could be spent, I'm sure, in a thousand other places, but you use it to, to write both long form and short form pieces? What, what inspires you to do that? Mostly uh, I look at subjects that maybe people are not well informed or they're not getting information or they're very germane to what we're doing now. So the thing that came up with Taiwan is that a number of people would understand semiconductors are a problem, but in the general public, they wouldn't. Uh, even within our own company, uh, some people are very engaged in technology, others are engaged in other activities. So it's important for them to know these things. So in terms of the book, I wanted to relate what we did, and, and I don't say this is the right way, I just say this is the way we did it, it may be helpful to you in the future. It also does another thing. It provides the history and background on the company. Because when someone comes in new to the company, they don't have any idea what it was like in the early founding and even in year 20. Uh, things have changed dramatically, thankfully for the better. But just like we study history, I think we need to study the company, know where it came from, what were the values that propelled us to be a large company. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Emily, I wonder if you could help us go from a big picture to a more detailed picture. Because uh, Bob's given us some great principles and ideas to think of that really are, are operating on a macro level scale for a company. Uh, now your work with human resources is a bit more granular and working with people, interacting with each other. Um, what are some of the boots on the ground uh, keys to success for being an effective employee at a middle to large size company? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think a lot of the um, characteristics that Bob mentioned of a successful business carry over to the employee as well. Things like alertness, being a continuous learner. Um, you know, I feel like it's important to understand the why. And so a lot of the information that Bob will send out to employees helps us kind of understand that, that why, why Captivare does what they do. Um, and I think even for our employees, like in Captivare, engineers need to understand why we design a kitchen system, kitchen ventilation system, the way that we do, not just plug and play. They need to really understand the foundation of it and the engineering behind it. So I think kind of that continuous, wanting to be a continuous learner, wanting to dig in deep and um, going along with that is initiative, um, actually taking the time to learn those things on your own. Um, we've got some really great leadership with Captivare, but we don't handhold, we don't micromanage. And so new employees coming in, they need to have that initiative to go out and find information for themselves, um, find the answers that they need. Um, ownership is something that, you know, kind of came to mind for me, thinking about not blaming others, not blaming, you know, we'll have people that come to us and say, well, I wasn't trained. Well, I, w I didn't know, I wasn't <laughs> trained. and. Um, take that ownership and find find that out for yourself. Um, the last thing I thought of was self-motivation, and that kind of goes along with what we've been talking about, asking questions, finding the answers for yourself when, when you can't have, you know, when you can't find them, when you don't know the answer. And I think all of this kind of goes into just hard work. We expect a lot of our employees. <laughs> we, uh, we, we all wear a lot of hats. We do a lot, and I think that a lot of people don't want to work hard anymore. I think there's kind of a cultural shift where they want to just kind of skate by and do the easiest thing possible. And um, coming to work on time, putting in a full day, focusing on the tasks at hand are all important things if you're going to be part of a company and if you're going to be successful working in that company. That all makes, I think that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it certainly makes for an interesting uh, workplace dynamic. Uh, to be filled with uh, a workplace filled with people who are trying to grow in those different areas. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, uh, I spent my first year as a teacher, uh, I was handed five different classes to prepare for and a very minimal curriculum for those. <laughs> and one of the things that, and I, it was very difficult that year, but I look back on it was incredibly helpful. I formed habits of going to the library to read up on topics that I was going to be teaching the following week. and. Uh, preparing materials that stood me in great stead in following years. Uh, and I've, I mean, there's, there's, and it, that's become one of the things that I'm looking, I look for in teachers now. And if they have the attitude like, okay, you've given me some resources and I see this gap, oh, I'm gonna go fill that gap. I'm gonna make this. That's the mark of a, a strong teacher. Uh, a teacher that comes back and says, well, I need some curriculum. Could you hand me a curriculum? 
I'm, I'm always willing to say, okay, well, let, let's look at that together. Let's see if we can work, figure that out. But that already is a mark of, that's, that's, okay, well, why aren't you figuring out an answer to that question is, is always part of the back of my mind. But I think that you mentioned uh, help, that it's important for employees to know why they're, they're doing what they do. I think that I was, this year, one of the books I've read was uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And he kind of is bringing a lot of Aristotle's teleology into the modern workforce of arguing that people actually, they work a lot better when they understand the purpose for what they're doing. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, we're not drones. <laughs> we want to know why we're doing what we're doing. And yeah, people are very reasonable and, and they have brains. And, and if they know why they're doing it and, and they realize it's important, you're going to get their heart and soul. Yeah. If you just say, do this because I told you to do it, that's going nowhere in the modern world and modern management. To your point on, you know, kind of wanting to go out and do more and develop those resources, that motivation isn't something that we can really train. That's something that's innate in some and, and not in others. And for us, it's finding those people and retaining those people that's critical because we can, we can train content knowledge, we can train, you know, how to design a kitchen system or how to teach history. But that, that drive and that motivation is something that we can't, we can't train. Yeah, Bill Griffin, who's the president of our manufacturing and engineering division, uh, when people say, I wasn't trained, he will say, well, who trained us? Right. And, and he says it in the sense of, think about what we're doing here. We had to learn all this from nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, you have many people around you that can help you learn, but learning is an individual thing. Mm -hmm. A teacher can't make you learn. They can assist you in the learning process. Yeah. And pretty much anybody at Captivere will assist you and help you in any way possible. But learning is an individual thing. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an old adage because it's true. You can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I mean, you can, yeah. uh, you can and, and we see this in the classroom all the time. I mean, you can, there are students who will do the minimum and they'll get just to get their A. They usually have that goal of getting their A. Uh, but it's the, the and the, uh, there are other students who don't always get the A, because they don't always do exactly what the test is asking them to do. But what they do that far surpasses the goal of an A is actually like learn the material, internalize the material, uh, synthesize it with everything else they're learning and figure out how do I, how does this shape me as a person? And like, and that person is prepared not just to pass the test, but really to go anywhere and do anything. I introduced a concept about five years ago, which has really been in my mind from the very beginning. And so we call it the bell lap. So you think about a runner, a horse, any type of uh, event. The bell lap means full intensity, a race to the goal line. So I introduced the con concept in this context. Every minute of every day, we're running on the bell lap. We're running as hard as we can go toward that finishing line. And if you do that, your life will be immensely enjoyable. You will accomplish so many things that you didn't think you could do but you have to have that very high level of personal motivation because nobody can motivate anyone else. Motivation is self-actuated, uh, self-induced. But if you do that, life is very, very joyful. And busy people are having fun and they're accomplishing an enormous amount of work and good, good uh, outcomes for the world. You know, that enjoyability is a fascinating thing. I definitely, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I've experienced that. The times that I am most satisfied in what I'm doing work-wise are usually the times that I'm actually doing the most. I think it, it reminds me of a section of, uh, of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics where he talks about the, uh, his principle of happiness. He calls it eudaimonia is the term for that. And it's, it's all, it always throws people for a loop because we think of happiness initially and we sort of think of like emotional pleasure kind of thing. Aristotle doesn't mean that. He means the satisfaction of being as excellent as you were intended to be. And that that path of excellence is not an easy one. It's a, this is where he then transitions to talk about virtue. And virtue is this road of where you're consistently making the right choices in a certain direction. And along that road is actually, you are the most fit, the most exercised, your mind is most engaged, and you are most fully alive. And there's a sense of joy that is only felt or only possible for those who are truly excellent in that way. Yeah, you think about the, uh, the senior people in this company, we're sending emails to each other at 6.30 in the morning and maybe 10 o'clock at night. And Sunday morning, we may be throwing a problem. And, and it's usually the most senior people that are working on those problems. Uh, so essentially, this is molded into their life. This is what we do, and we love doing it. 
So really, to, to, be a, to be a successful person then uh, certainly involves a lot of personal motivation. It involves identifying with the work that you've chosen to do and then doing that work to the highest degree with the greatest amount of ownership and responsibility possible. Perfectly stated. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Emily, one more question if you could start us off with. I, I know it's, uh, it's one thing for people to go from one job where they've been for five to 10 years from one company and then go into another company. Th those folks usually have basic professional habits down. But I wonder if you could uh, think for us for a moment about the fresh out of college intern or new employee who is first time in the corporate world. Uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm at least, I'm gonna describe myself. I'm not gonna throw anyone else under the bus. Uh, in college, I got a haircut about once a semester and I, I did not shave very often. And uh, I thought a t-shirt and shorts were professional attire. And, and a lot of that had to get knocked out of me uh, working a bunch of part-time jobs before I could go work for a, a full-time position. Um, what kind of advice would you give to that sort of person who has been very successful in a college environment, but is now looking to enter the workforce at a, at a somewhat high level? What, what kinds of habits does that person need? Well, I'll start with attire, as you, since you mentioned it. Uh, there's that common you know, saying of dress for the job you want, not the job that you have. And so I think that that's critical. We have an old, I think it's from like 2015 or 2016 article that we'll send out, I think it was from the Wall Street Journal about, you know, business dress, dress for, you know, for success to be professional. And we'll send that to interns, we'll send that to new hires. And it, when you're dressed for professionalism, it kind of forces you to be a little bit more professional. So I would say that about attire. You know, I think, you know, thinking about um, the application process, the job interview process, one of the biggest downfalls that we see um, is candidates that we know are not actively working or they're working a part-time job and we start interviewing them and they've done no research on the company. Mm -hmm. They know nothing mm -hmm. about Captive Air and our products. You know, I often ask the question, which of our products stood out to you? Did any of our products stand out to you? And when they say no, <laughs> you know that they really, <laughs> or they'll say, yeah, you make hoods, right? And so you know that they didn't really look. Or for Thales Academy, when we talk about classical education, and they're like, well, what is that? Um, you know that they really didn't, they didn't even, they didn't even open the website, honestly. Like, we always laugh, our, one of our recruiters and myself for Captive Air, the front page of our website says, DOAS, our Paragon Dedicated Outdoor Air System and people don't even see it. You know they didn't even open the website. So I think that that is critical for new grads. Um, know what you're interviewing for, know why you want the job, why you wanna work for that company. Um, asking questions, so it shows your engagement and it shows that you actually want to understand the company and the job. So that would be more once you're in the interview process, having questions for everyone who interviews you. And then just kind of you know broad overreaching during the application and candidacy process is being prompt and responsive. We'll have people that'll go a week and then they'll respond and say, oh yeah, I'd like to interview. Um, that It says a lot about you, how quickly you respond, how eager you mm -hmm. are. Um, I think that that goes a long way. Um, and you know, even kind of before getting close to graduation, tips and tricks for college students thinking about work, I think having any sort of work experience is valuable. So whether that's a formal internship, if they're an engineering student, or working at McDonald's. Or one of our um, engineering managers always says he'd rather have somebody that worked at McDonald's than somebody that just did school and nothing else. <laughs> because it teaches you work ethic, it teaches you how to operate in, in the business world. Yeah, one of our senior engineers has a standard speech he gives, you're not in college any longer, yeah. <laughs> which means you come to work on time every single day. Um, you dress correctly. You work all day long, okay? <laughs> um, and it's surprising that you would have to give that speech, but the college environment, as you stated, is entirely different than the work environment. This is serious business, and we expect, uh, and I think this idea of response Someone responds in a week and then they say, I might be available in two weeks. Right. Really? <laughs> do you really want a job? Uh, I don't think you could work here because we do everything possible when we call real time, immediately, yeah. if at all possible. Some things can't be done in real time. So slow responders, customers expect response immediate. They expect drawings in hours. Right. It used to be, 
if they got them in a couple of days, that was a win. A win. Now it's a couple of hours. Uh, they want real time information because they're used to the internet. You get an immediate response. We contact you. We want an immediate response because uh, the bell app. We're, we're intense. We're moving. Uh, I think that reminds me of a. Uh I was over uh, a moment this past year where uh, I was overseeing pictures for one group of students and uh, we had, because of COVID situations, we had about 12 small groups of students that were coming to go through the photo process. And uh, we had initially set that up where there was this five minute gap in between uh, each group of students. But I started to realize like, wait a minute, we go and call that next group up. Let's just, let's just run them right on through. We finished about an hour and a half early and just over that five minute interval. Yeah. I, yeah. We got rid of that. And I was talking to the photographer like, man, you guys are just like the other people at Thales Apex. That we're, <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's just part of our, it's just part of our culture where we're like, yeah. okay, what's the most efficient use of our time? How can we not, and I mean, I, I, I don't think we try, we try not to get to sort of an extreme where we're always rushing and we do sloppy work. But the question is, what's the most efficient use of our time? How can we accomplish the, the best quality work in the time that we have? And not always, but most of the time we do our best work moving quickly. Mm -hmm. There can be exceptions. Right. And sometimes we move too quickly and that's something we have to be cautious of all the time. But people who are really intense and alert, they've already thought through a lot of the things and how they're gonna approach them. Um, so we, we love that environment. It's just fun. I'll add real quick as well. A few years ago, we were interviewing a candidate. I think it was for a sales engineering role. and found out he was also interviewing with one of our competitors and took our offer because of how quickly we responded and moved him through the interview process, got him an offer. And so it shows the value of that kind of quick response, both for customers and then also, I mean, from my end, from HR, my customers are the employees. And when we're quick to respond, quick to follow up, it leads to results in hiring and retaining employees as well. You know, related to that, um, when people come from the first day, and particularly if they work somewhere else, mm -hmm. we have their computer ready, their desk is ready, their, their assignments are like, bam, we're ready to go. And people have told me they've, they've gone to places and four weeks later, they still don't have their computer. Right. I mean, what do, you, what do you do if you don't have a computer in the modern world? <laughs> uh, so that fast start leads to that continuous intensity. Yeah. Now, let me ask one more question on the kind of a relate, related to this topic. Uh, or my, my first professional job was uh, teaching at Thales Academy. At the time, it was we were the middle school branch of the Wake Forest campus, and it grew into Thales Rollsville. And uh, I kind of quickly learned that there were some unexpected expectations, or at least things that were clear. <laughs> they were expressed, they were stated, but then they were actually expected. And uh, my boss at the time was Melissa Edwards, and she had a uh, it mattered a lot to her that everyone be present in the building on time by 7.35 a.m. because our contract stated the day began at 7.35 a.m. And uh, at that, at least initially for me, was a struggle. I would, I would tend to roll in <laughs> at 7.40 and we had, she had a very frank conversation with me. Like, look, if you cannot be here on time, how can you expect students to turn their work in on time? How can we expect you to be a team player? All these things that for her were symbolized by being on time. Now that was really helpful for me. It helped me learn that like that's a real expectation. I, I started developing habits so that I would actually be there by 7.15 so that I had some leeway if I was there late. But uh, I wonder what you would both say to uh, kind of the, the counter example. I was reading an article this morning about typical startup culture and sort of a a startup company that has a very laid back, loose, relaxed culture. Uh, how common would you both think, say that those kinds of uh, maybe not written down, but very real expectations like being on time and being professionally attired, how common are those and how much do those factor into uh, employees' performance reviews in, in most companies? I would say they're, they're less common today. And you know, if a company starts and they have lots of venture capital money, they can be very loosey-goosey, but eventually it's gonna catch up with them. So we run on discipline and our customers expect a very fast response. Employees wanna work in an environment where everybody's pulling their load. Uh, one of the things that I observed about teachers, if a teacher's doing a great job and the teacher next to her is not doing a good job, they're not happy 
because they're there really. They love those kids and they want to teach them and they want to see the whole school create that outcome. Uh, I had an experience at Thales where the school at that time opened at 740. So I decided I was going to go up and it, it stressed the parents out because they need to be at work at 8 o'clock. So they didn't open at 740, they opened at 741, which probably in their mind was pretty good, right? right? And I said, well, okay, here's going to be the cure for that problem. We're going to open at 720. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I was observing is the parents, are they, they need to move and they need to get to work and we're there to serve them, why would we be a minute late when the time is not that great for the parents anyhow? So I just solved that problem on the spot. So this continuous discipline is very important to the people we serve, and that's why we do it. A couple of thoughts yeah. from a captive air side and, and Thales side. I think our best managers are really good about laying out expectations up front because that helps the employees thrive when they know, like you said, you're supposed to be there at 735. She explained why, as we talked about earlier. <laughs> so I've seen emails from some of our managers when they have new hires that say, these are our office hours. This is what you're expected to do. This is how you're expected to dress. And I think that helps set people up for success kind of outside of our organization, there's a movement, especially in like the startup cultures for, you know, unlimited PTO, for example, unlimited time off. And I think that ends up creating <laughs> an environment. <laughs> Bob would love that. I'm getting nervous. It, oh, ends up, it ends up creating an environment where th there will be people that take advantage of it. And then there's people that are hard workers that want to be there. And it almost creates animosity between, you know, it, it, you're looked down on for taking time mm. off because you're not given time off. You have this kind of flexible, take as much time off as you want. Uh, I think it, it creates a, a difficult dynamic in those companies and the, the employees that, that want to be here and want to work hard, like you said, the teachers that want to teach, they're not happy when they're with people who aren't working hard. Yeah, I heard a commercial the other day and they were advertising an answering service. And so she starts out and says, well, Jim's playing golf today. Uh, <laughs> Bubba's off today. Uh, Sam's in a meeting. Oh. Yeah, Linda's in the office. I'll get you Linda. Like, oh my <laughs> gosh. I mean, that's, that's your laid back culture. Right. It, it, I think it becomes really, it does become really hard. I mean, I think we've, uh, the, there have definitely been times when I need my, my ability to do the next piece of what I'm working on depends on somebody else. Mm -hmm. If that person's there, we can solve it pretty quickly. If that person's not there, it's, it's hard. But, um, I mean, I just, it, but at the same time, I think our, the, the way our contracts work, uh, for Thales at least, it's, it's very straightforward. You have these many days that you can take off, and with a few exceptions related to the, the testing calendar, um, no one really bats an eye if you say, hey, I'm taking Friday off, because, and nobody really asks why. It's just like, I can do that. But the unlimited time off is fascinating. That, I, I wonder if that will become more... Those kinds of issues even become more significant as companies are moving more and more towards like remote work as a permanent thing in, in, in our post-COVID world. Yeah, Emily and I talked about this the other day. Supposing she's home or I'm home for six months, mm -hmm. we don't see each other, we may have emails. You just don't have that connectivity of all these fast decisions that are made and all the stimulation you get from working around people, which for me is the most fun. That's why I like working here. I love working with talented people. It's a thrill, it really is, I love it. You can't get that from home. Now, people that you have a really good rapport with, you, you can be remote for a period of time, but not indefinitely, not forever. And this idea you come and go what you want, trains need to run on time, <laughs> okay? <laughs> We're, we're very decentralized. Um, Captive Air, we have engineering offices in Pennsylvania, in Utah, we have plants all over. But you know, there'll be times each year that we kind of bring our leadership team together. And those are some of our most productive meetings. Meetings are not usually productive, but when we're all kind of decentralized and come together for those short times, it, it's really helpful to all get into the room together, you know, iron out some more bigger picture concepts. There's a lot of, that can be answered by email that you can, we, we hardly have meetings, but there's other things that it's helpful just to go face to face and say, how do you want to do this? What's the plan for this? And actually, you know, finalizing those things in person that, that would be challenging to do. Yeah, even months. five to 10 minutes a day yeah. stimulates a lot of thinking. It may not take any more than that, but it's important. <laughs> oh, fantastic. 
Well, let me kind of shift directions a little bit. Uh, the COVID-19 provided a lot of challenges for schools and for businesses. Uh, but I'm kind of curious what y'all would say to this. Uh, in what ways did COVID provide opportunities for Captive Air or for the various Luddy schools? The opportunities for uh, Captive Air are overwhelming for a number of reasons. One is that now clean, fresh, filtered air is in vogue. People understand it and they want it. And that's our principal future product. So that product line is uh, more than doubling in sales every single year. Secondly, and back to the point we were just talking about, many of our competitors are still working at home. Some of them are gonna be working at home until September. Yep. And meanwhile, our team has been on the ground working wide open. We never closed down, we never slowed down. We are gaining market share at the most rapid pace in the history of the company even more rapidly than in the founding, when we would grow 40 to 50%, 30 to 50, we're growing at 70%. Unheard of for a company of our size. So the opportunities unfolding for Captivere are just absolutely enormous. I would say for Captivere as well, it allowed us to do some restructuring, look at our teams, make some of those you know, personnel, company organization decisions. Thankfully, I mean, I would say, impact of COVID-19, you know, layoffs and things like that were extremely minimal, but it did allow us the opportunity to look at what we were doing as a whole and, and look at, you know, the, the staff that we have, who do we need in place to keep us ready for 70% growth and, and be positioned for success. Um, on the school side, I mean, we were pioneers with COVID. I mean, our enrollment exploded um, from COVID. We, it, May of last year, we were like, we might end up losing it. Like, we don't know if people are gonna be able to afford Thales. We don't know, like our enrollment might tank. And then um, it was the weekend of July 4th. It was a three day weekend. And our admissions team came back and they said, we have 300 unread emails and 200 voicemails. Oh because goodness. Wake County Schools had Unheard announced, of. yeah, they had announced that they were gonna go full remote. And all these parents said, we want our kids in a school, in person. And so we opened in the middle of July. We were the first school in the area open. Um, and so we really set ourselves apart, both to be able to serve our, our students and, and the families, uh, as well as being bold and not, you know, falling to the pressures of the, the culture, the environment around us. And so I think that we, in our enrollment this year, is we, we did, it didn't drop off. We said this year too, okay, the public schools are gonna open again. Are we gonna lose those kids that came to us out of desperation and they're staying? We so. have another major expansion actually. Yeah. And I received emails and letters from parents and phone calls, a very large number, so thankful saying, you're taking care of our children. Mm -hmm. you're, you're helping our family. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Matter of fact, on the first day of opening, I was in Rollsville on the line and people are giving me the high five and they're rolling their window down. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for getting my kids so, out of the house. <laughs> so people respond to, to good thinking and good behavior and good outcomes. Yeah. That's, that's my take home. Yeah, and I think that it's kind of the perfect storm, you know, this past year with COVID and with kind of the cultural shift in the public schools, Thales really stands out as kind of a safe place for a lot of these families and, and teachers. We're getting a lot of teachers coming out of the public school systems that just say, I, I can't, I can't teach that. Mm. So we've really been able to accelerate mm. our growth and, and really kind of firm up our, our positions and our place in, in this market. I think it's fascinating that uh, the culture has shifted to the point where uh, without having to get, uh, to go back to what we discussed earlier, kind of avoiding politics in the business and, and on the school side in the classroom, uh, to get to the point where you are committed to teaching a traditional text list in literature class and a relatively traditional view of history and a straightforward factual narrative and experimental approach to science that's now relatively controversial and but parents want it students want it <laughs> and the uh, just kind of planting a flag and saying we're doing the exact same thing we have always done and just teaching great subjects with great for uh, with great teachers teaching wonderful subjects to wonderful students and that is a that's been a winning combination this year for sure and we're producing some magnificent students i mean that are really engaged to go to college to uh be productive in their lives, and, and, and they're happy that they've learned so much in school. 
we see them come through. We will get interns mm -hmm. that come through from various Luddy schools and compared to their counterparts who did not attend the Luddy schools, it's exceptional. The difference, I mean, they're hard workers, they're thinkers, they're engaged, they're professional. So it's it's really amazing to see the results. Our yeah, the schools weren't started as a farm team for Captive Air. They were not. <laughs> <laughs> but just inadvertently, we've hired probably a dozen and, and we've come to realize uh, we, we ought to be hiring all these people <laughs> to the extent that they have the talent and, and, the, and the interest. Yeah. But our, our alumni consistently uh, report back, whether they're at NC State or UNC Chapel Hill or UNC Wilmington or uh, hopefully next year out of uh, University of St. Andrews in Scotland, they consistently report back that their junior and senior year years at Thales Academy are more rigorous than their freshman and sophomore years in college, okay. and that they are eminently well prepared to enter into the top schools in the nation and uh, get the best that those schools have to offer. Now, um, as, as we begin kind of uh, closing out today's episode, uh, Bob, I wonder if we could get your thoughts on our current economic moment. The, uh, the, the Federal Reserve consistently denies inflation, but various uh, private uh, registers have said that we're at uh, double, uh, that prices have risen 3.5% over last year in comparison. So we're looking at kind of double the normal predicted 2% inflation rate. Uh, what are your thoughts on our current economic moment with governmental spending and uh, President Biden's looming budget proposal hand, uh, sitting in Congress? <laughs> what, what are your thoughts for businesses particularly about this well, we've named moment. it the convoluted economy. <laughs> so I studied uh, finance in college, and we, in college you learn what's normal, you learn some aberrations. We're in the most severe aberration time in, in the history of the world. So the Fed's controlling interest rates to zero. Interest is a cost. So you think about, you buy a house, you might pay the same amount for interest over time as you paid for the house, depending on the interest rate and how long you finance it for. So interest is a huge cost. When, when you turn it to zero, you have what they call malinvestment. So now people start make, doing funny things because their cost curve has been changed very, very dramatically. So the Fed controlling these low interest rates and then they buy government bonds. So they become the prime enabler to fiscal spending at the federal level, which now has gone from bad to terrible to severe. Well, now they talk trillions. Uh, uh, Everett Dirtson back in the 60s has said, pretty soon a dollar here, a dollar there, a bill here, and pretty soon you're talking billions. Now we're talking trillions of dollars. The average person doesn't even know what a trillion dollars is. Additionally, if that wasn't enough, they're paying people not to work for a very long period of time. And they pay them more not to work than if they were working. Think about the market distortions. Uh, one Austrian economist put it well that, all of the government interventions essentially lead to malinvestment and bad outcomes. And then what does the government do? We, sh we shut down the economy. How do we fix it? We spend trillions of dollars. Those trillions of dollars are being misallocated. So eventually, hardworking people have to make up for all that malinvestment. You also have, if that wasn't enough, we have tariffs, we have trade restrictions, we have endless uh, regulations being put on business. So we have tremendous shortages of products and services for all those reasons. So the economy is now, and then shortages always lead to what? Inflation. And we have very high inflation in the industrial market. And on top of that shortages, so normally what would happen, there's not a lot of money floating around, prices are rising, orders begin to decline, it self-corrects within the market. And it can self-correct very rapidly. But if someone's putting gasoline on the fire, the fire continues. <laughs> and the federal government's not only putting gasoline on the fire, they're putting a fire hose of gasoline on the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so it's gonna burn for a long time. So tremendous number of interventions, distortions within the market, and no economist can figure this out because there's too many variables. Mm -hmm. Normally we have, most things are fixed. We look at the variables, how would they come out? Everything now is a variable. Uh, so we're in a very tough economy. But if you're gonna be an entrepreneur and you're gonna be in business, you need to be prepared to deal with the worst. So you don't sit down and, and cry about it. And this is kind of a dirty little secret, but we always complain about these things. But in the end, Captive Air always comes out a winner because we take on that challenge 
and we do well with it. <clears throat> So really then the, the, I mean, it sounds like the, the action steps, if you will, for a, a convoluted economy, which I love that phrase, the, uh, the convoluted economy. That's a yeah, that's not phrase. the official name now. Uh, <laughs> <can't well>, right. <laughs> maybe from this we episode, do presentations we can, on that. <laughs> maybe we can get that trending on Twitter about the uh, okay. con hashtag convoluted <laughs> economy. But um, now as part, it sounds like the, the answers to that, if there are answers, are really the same ones they've always been. I mean, good work. Uh, prudential judgments and uh, keep bringing the best to the marketplace that you can and serve the customers well and on a private level keep doing the same things Captive Air has always been doing. Yeah, think about this. Um, Captive Air is debt free. So last year what happened to major corporations, they were out borrowing as much money as they could to get through the crisis. Well, guess what? That money has to be paid back someday. Uh, so they've put themselves way in a hole, whereas Captive Air just glided right through because we don't have any debt. And that gives us the resilience to deal with pretty much any problem that comes along. It also allows us to take risks that other companies can't take because they may have covenants that restrict uh, what they can do. We have, no, we have no bankers. We lend our bankers money. <laughs> we are the banker. <laughs> we have a lot of really forward thinking our team, we have a really strong team as well. So, you know, you think of material shortages, a lot of companies are facing those shortages. Our supply chain team has done a great job of keeping the ship running and keeping things coming in. And um, labor shortages, definitely a challenge. We are seeing that, but you know, it's kind of an all hands on deck. We've got our president of manufacturing and engineering has been working on the line <laughs> in, the, in the plants to help keep things running. Yeah, I was meeting yesterday with the president of manufacturing and the supply chain manager. And in a 20 minute meeting, we decided how we were gonna get through the stainless crisis, what we were gonna do in terms of changing uh, electronic boards. So we, we mapped it all out. That doesn't mean we won't have some problems ongoing, but we're on top of every detail every day and we're using every resource we know internationally to solve those problems. Yeah. Some of them are pretty tough problems because <laughs> if a supplier just doesn't ship, right. uh, sometimes there's not an easy plan B, uh, but we'll get through it. I, mean, I think it's, I, at least I've been reading more widely uh, and uh, recently about economic issues and the supply chain deficiencies are fascinating. I mean, the, I had no idea just how interconnected our globalized economy had become until a, uh, if I understand it right, the, uh, the primary, or the, the best um, computer chips are manufactured out of one company in Taiwan. Taiwan Semiconductor. And uh, if, if they stop producing, like, uh, Apple can no longer <laughs> make things, and like there are so many companies, even uh, even things as silly as chicken wings have skyrocketed in price because we messed up the uh, chicken production process. And, I mean, it just we're we're seeing these these movements all throughout the economy that are I, I, I just it points to the interconnected web of economic activity and just how breakable it is. Uh, Jim Grant, who's a, a very good financial thinker, he said, "Here's how the Fed thinks about things." It's like a, a, a water a modulator. We get a little more cold, a little more hot, so we just dial in whatever we need. The economy's made up of millions of people worldwide and millions of companies, and they're making these decisions every day based on granular information that they have. The politician doesn't even have a remote sense of how the economy runs. You don't turn it off <laughs> and then turn it back on like a, a water faucet. Right. And so they've created just enormous distortions. And if that weren't enough, then they create more distortions on top of that. And God forbid, then they want to fix the problem. Now we're really in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Well, as we're wrapping up our time together today, uh, I wanted to close out with a, a question for both of you. Uh, this, this show really grew out of a conversation that uh, you and I had a few months ago, Bob, about the, uh, the, the necessity for people to speak truth into a society that is increasingly distant from truth. Uh, one area I want to get your thoughts on is sort of the, uh, the sense, at least I, this is the sense I have, that a lot of people disconnect virtue from business. And they think that business is really just about making choices that earn money as, for as many people as quickly as possible. I know one of your convictions over the years has been that there actually is this real connection between being a virtuous person, seeking truth, and being an active player in the marketplace. So I wonder if both of you could Close us out today with uh, speaking to the role of truth and character in the workplace. Does it really matter that coworkers <clears throat> be virtuous people? Trust and virtue are paramount to business. 
So you think about we're giving people credits for hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars. We're trusting a supplier in Germany to ship us a fan. Virtue is absolutely necessary. And if someone is not virtuous, we're going to figure it out very quickly. They're going to be pushed out immediately. So virtue is, a, uh, even among a c hardcore business people, there's that sense of trust. And if it's ever violated, then, then you're done. And people know that. So they may be not the best characters in the world at some times, but they understand to operate in the business world, you better be trustworthy. You better do what you say you're going to do, or you're not going to be in business over time. So virtue to me is paramount and absolutely important, and trust and honesty and integrity. Investors Business Daily has 10 ways to be successful in their print every week. Number 10 is integrity. And I said, if you don't have integrity and honesty, the other nine don't matter. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Bob came back from a seminar a couple of years ago now, and you know, kind of fr from an HR perspective, this is really critical. He was talking about this matrix where you know, you've got technical and then ethical, I think, was kind of the, the two categories. Mm -hmm. And you can have somebody who's highly technical but very low ethics. <coughs> it's one of your most dangerous people. You want to find the people that are highly technical mm -hmm. and highly ethical, or even highly ethical and low technical because you can train it. But that most dangerous person is the one who is, is very savvy, very technical, very smart, but the ethics are extremely low. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you're using a structural bolt, it's got a stamp on there that defines it as approved structural. Well, we're buying these bolts through a supplier and we notice coming in, there's no stamp on there. Mm. They're sliding in lower cost bolts. Yeah. So I found about in real time and I said, okay, terminate the supplier today, okay? Don't ever use them again. We went to the manufacturer of the bolt who only makes those. And we've, that's, we've done that for the last five years. So recently I ran into an employee that worked at that company and he was making the comment, yeah, Bob fired us on the spot and for good reason. Huh. We didn't do what we, we told him we were gonna do and we were jeopardizing their company. So he's telling, I didn't even know, know some of the background. He's telling the story to other people and those stories in the market make people realize I better be honest, I'll get fired, I'll be out of business. Yeah. I think within a team dynamic, mm -hmm we need to be able to trust others on our team. You don't want to go through life feeling like, oh, that person's going to throw me under the bus if I screw up or if I do something wrong. And so, you know, within like the leadership team within Thales and, and Captive Air, we have this dynamic where we trust each other. We know that everybody that's involved is highly ethical, committed to helping each other. And so I think that is critical to be able to have a company run efficiently is to have that level of trust um, with each other. And kind of going along with that, and something that I really appreciate here is we respect the ideas of everyone. It doesn't matter where they're at in the company. Who, they can be an intern or they could be the president of manufacturing and we want to hear out their their ideas and thoughts and that's something that Bob encourages he'll send out emails and say your thoughts are solicited your you know your opinion is you know I want to hear what you're thinking I want to hear your ideas how do we how do we fix this our employees are the ones out boots on the ground working and they're the ones that are going to have those answers and if we don't listen to them because you know we're up here in our you know our office and not connected because we know all the answers because we're in charge, we're not gonna move forward. Yeah, the solicited, you know, I always put that in there, I usually mm -hmm. do. And people will, they'll kind of second guess, say, well, he really doesn't wanna hear what right. we do. So <laughs> underline, I said solicited. And I, I, at one point I said, I'm defining solicited. I gave him a definition of what it means. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's a natural to be hesitant to say, well, they don't, I'm just new here right. or, Maybe they won't like what I have to say. Yeah, we want to hear what you have to say. We may not act on it. Mm -hmm. We may not agree with you, right. but we're going to listen to you. Yeah. And that is really important in business. And I think Bob already said this, and I think it's it's important to you know kind of reinforce. If you don't have strong moral character, it's going to be found out, and usually relatively yeah. quickly. And those people are worked out of our organization quickly because we don't we don't need that affecting our reputation, hurting our customers. I mean, our, our primary goal is high quality products at the best possible price, high quality education at the best possible price. And somebody that's compromising those standards, it, it does not belong here. And it, it gets found out very quickly. 
Well, I think that's not that's that's true not only for kind of the the places that we're we're in collectively as a trio, but uh, certainly it's also the case on a national and an international scale. I mean, I don't think a month goes by without some big name figure who has uh, really disqualified him or herself through some sort of moral failing for the leadership role that that person was in. Every right. day, every yeah. single day. I mean, uh, it just, it, it, uh, every year there are moments where I'm just confronted with students who make choices and it, it becomes a, it shapes my, my attempt at uh, doing kind of classroom discipline to be able to help students know in this moment you've made this poor choice. Uh, and, and really, you now have another choice. You can choose to be a person who learns from this and learns that you will be found out and, and, uh, and eventually the consequences escalate the higher your position is in society. Or you can choose to decide, you know what, I'm not going to be the person who makes that kind of choice. Mm -hmm. And that, that eventually, that's a harder road. It's a harder road to be a person of strong morals and strong character. But it leads to the kind of joy and the excellence that we were talking about earlier. Well, Bob, Emily, thank you so much for uh, joining me today for a uh, mostly business-centered conversation. This has been great to kind of get to hear both of your perspectives. Uh, thank you, listeners, for joining us for another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. If you like this episode, please leave us a five-star review wherever you uh, watch or listen to our show and share it with your friends. Until next time, seek the good, discover the true, and love the beautiful.